delighted to have Helen Thorne with us, who is Director of Training and Resources for Biblical Council in the UK and the Women in Ministry Advisor for Crossroads Training. She's an experienced speaker, so we expect her <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no pressure. And she's also an author whose books include Mental Health in Your Church, Hope in an Anxious World, Walking with Domestic Abuse Sufferers, and Find Things to Pray for Your City in Real Change. She lives in southwest London and is engaged to Nick, very fond of both gardening, which I am as well, so we can chat about that later, and Korean food. Mm. I understand that. Her session will not be based on Korean food, but will inform us greatly, I'm sure. So you're very welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Peter. And if I can find a way of integrating Korean food into this session, believe me, uh, I will just uh, change glasses and uh, we can uh, make it start. Well, this morning, uh, in our first session, Steve was introducing us to a number of the principles uh, to undergird our understanding of mental health, mental illness, and how to help people in the church. What we're going to be looking at in our second session is much more about the big picture of how we can help. We're not going to get into the specifics of case studies, that's, that's for after lunch. But this is some of the skills, some of the considerations that we want to be putting into place to help people well in their struggles. Now, I'm really conscious that in this room and online, we have uh, a wide range of people, uh, men and women, uh, those of uh, a younger disposition, those whose hair displays great maturity mm -hmm. uh, in the number of years uh, that we've been on this earth. Uh, we are in a, a range of different denominations, a range of different styles of churches. Uh, and so there's going to be uh, an element that I'm going to be throwing out things for us to discuss and to work out in our particular contexts, encouraging us to be thinking through, well, what part can I play as a pastor, as a trainee minister, as a member of the congregation, as a small group leader, as a doctor who happens to be a member of a church? What can I do with the gifts that God has given me in the context that he has placed me to walk alongside people wisely and well? Well, with that in mind, I want us to get a baseline as we start of where our hearts are. Steve asked us a, a gloriously impersonal question out on well at the end of his session, which is what are some of the barriers that the church faces? Well, where we're going to start today is much more personal. And I'm not going to ask you to say this out now. This is just for your quiet reflection. I want you to imagine that someone comes up to you after church on a Sunday morning and says that they are having a significant struggle with their mental health. Uh, I'm not talking about them feeling a little bit sad. Uh, I'm talking about this being something that is feeling quite overwhelming to them. Something that has a lot of symptoms uh, that are deeply, deeply painful. And they come to you and say, can you help? What is your first instinct? Are you someone that just wants to run at that point? Now, the fact that you've given up a Saturday to be here probably leans you away from that category. But nevertheless, in our heart of hearts, maybe some of us are still there. Are we people that just want to get out of there? This is not what I signed up for. This is not my gifting. This is not what I want to be doing on my Sunday after church. Help. Please don't make me have this conversation, Lord. Or, or maybe you are someone that tends towards referral. Now, some referral is good and wise, but you are a, a global referrer. You are absolutely, passionately committed to the thought that God has something to say to everyone who is struggling, and the church has a part to play in supporting everyone who is struggling. But it's not you. Someone else in the church can do that role. Let's, let's get the minister. <laughs> or that really wise person in the church that's a retired GP. Let's get them. They'd be great at this. I'll, I'll go off and do something else. Thank you very much. 
Maybe you're neither of those categories. Maybe you are somebody that is quite up for the challenge because you think you can fix this situation. You look at the person in front of you, you listen to their problems, and you go, yep, yeah, I get that, I know what we need to do. Okay, here are our three steps, they probably all begin with the same letter. Mm -hmm. And we work our way through these three steps, and at the end of it, you're going to be fine. Just, just follow me, just do what I say, and it's all going to be better. I hope we can all see that even if that is where our hearts are, there are massive downsides to each of those places. If we want to run away, then we give the impression that actually God and his people have nothing to say on that particular form of suffering. If we refer, we are othering people. Maybe God and his people does have something to say, but actually, it, this is not for me, this is not for the the sort of the average Christian. It has to be just a special subsect that can speak into this. And so you know, you're welcome here, but, but over there, please, in the corner, where someone proper can help you. We can never fix another human being, no matter what their struggle is. We can never make it all better. One of the, the key things that we need to remember in any form of pastoral ministry is that deep need to take off our superwoman or superman cape and know that we are not God. We cannot heal. We cannot change lives. That is the Holy Spirit's work, not ours. Maybe you're here already. But if not, let me nudge you towards considering this stance instead. But when that person comes to speak to you on Sunday, after the service, <clears throat> that you commit to doing what you can with your eyes on Christ, acknowledging that you can't do everything, but that you will be able to do something. <coughs> now the different facets of that are really important. Committing to doing what we can. It is a commitment to walk alongside someone that's struggling. This is not one conversation and make it all better. This is that I am committed to walking alongside you in some way for a period of time. Not necessarily for the rest of their lives, uh, but actually for more than one conversation. With eyes on Christ because it is his world and his work. And the person that we're walking alongside is his precious child. And it will be his spirit that is changing the situation, changing their hearts. And it is for his glory that we labour. It is in his strength that we speak and encourage. If our eyes are anywhere other than on Christ, we have the danger of becoming self-reliant. And that will either lead us to, to flurry into despair because we can't do it, or, or puff us up because we think we can. We need that humble attitude. Acknowledging there are limits, even if we are working in the field of mental health, have 20 years of experience, uh, know our Bibles wonderfully, are incredibly prayerful, utterly dependent, understand uh, psychiatric, psychiatric diagnoses really well, we still can't do everything. As human beings, we are limited, we are finite. God has designed us to be part of a community where we are just one person. Gifts. But actually, most of us aren't people with that level of experience anyway. Most of us are people that are dipping a toe into this area. And whilst we want to be absolutely passionate that God equips us to do something, we need the humility to know that we're not in that space. And sometimes we do need people that understand things far more deeply than we do. But even if we are scared, even if we are small, even if we have no training in this area, there will always be something we can do. Humbly, because we know we don't know everything. Dependently, because we need the Lord. Wisely, because we all have different capacities and capabilities. Collaboratively, because we are all limited. And joyfully, because this is a privilege. When someone comes and speaks to us after service, that is the sign of God at work. 
helping them to ask for help. That's not easy. If you've ever struggled with your own mental health, you will know that it's hard. It is an absolute privilege to walk alongside people who are struggling. God is at work if someone has come and spoken to you after the service. God is at work in you as you listen. This is part of the privilege of being his children, his community, speaking hope into brokenness, speaking hope into the most difficult of situations. And whilst, of course, we don't want to be all smiley and laughy when we're listening to people that are telling us difficult things about their lives, this is not something we thought that the Lord is asking us to do. This is something that is good. This is something that is beautiful. And this is something that has the potential to bear great fruit. Well, what would it actually look like? What we're going to do over the course of the, the next hour or so is look at six different aspects of what this might look like. Now, these are not chronological. We don't start with one and work our way through these six things. These are six scattergun ideas which you may want to consider for your own church. Six areas that you might want to grow in. At the end of today, you might think, yes, I've mastered uh, at least partially three of those. I want to grow in two and ignore one. That's absolutely fine. Be thinking creatively and practically and realistically about what you can take away from this day. But I'm going to start with what is probably not about speaking to individuals, but about creating a culture of care within the local church. And we do that by raising awareness of mental health struggles or struggles in the local church. Sometimes when I'm doing talks, I talk about the miracle of the church card mark. It, this is not a biblical concept, in case you were wondering, uh, but it's something that I have observed in many churches up and down the land. And it goes something like this. There's audience participation in the mix, so brace yourselves. It's Sunday morning. You've got up late. You've overslept and you are feeling broken. As whoever else is in your house, whether that's a parent, a child, a spouse or a friend, they have driven you mad that morning. Uh, the tension in the house is uh, through the roof uh, and, and to you know, add it all in, uh, the door or the cat has brought in some random dead mouse or dead pigeon just to spice up the morning uh, completely. That The house is in utter chaos uh, and you leave it angry, frustrated, resentful, uh, and quite frankly, wishing the world would go away. And that's the best case scenario. You know, that's not throwing in the fact that maybe we have deep anxiety that we're wrestling with, or deep depression that we're wrestling with, or, or some other kind of grief that is weighing deep on our hearts. And we drive to church and we park the car uh, and we get out of the car probably in stony silence with the other person we're with. We walk up to the church gates and there is somebody near the front door with a big smile on their face. And they say, good morning, welcome to church, how are you? And we all answer, oh, thank you. It's the miracle of the church car park. <laughs> you arrive at the church car park, a broken human being, and yet you walk into church absolutely fine. I don't know how it happens. Well, of course, it doesn't happen, does it? Now, sometimes when we go into church, we are fine. And even if we're not fine, I'm not suggesting we tell everything to the person on the door. You will find your welcome team diminished greatly <laughs> if that were the case. But there is a sense in which a lot of us go into church to pretend. And actually, I know from my own experience, sometimes those of us who are involved in leading services actually encourage us, leave your problems at the door and come and meet Christ. That's not what the Bible encourages us to do. Come all who are heavy laden, bring your problems, bring your brokenness, bring all the relational stress and strife and drag that into church and plop it at the foot of the cross alongside your brothers and sisters. One of the most helpful things we can do 
for those who are struggling is just to be real about the fact that we all struggle. Not in the same way, not necessarily to the same extent, but we are broken people living in a broken, a fallen world, turning to God together in our brokenness. It's a Genesis 3 thing. It's acknowledging that we don't live in Genesis 1 and 2, nor do we live in Revelation 21 and 22. We live in the middle, in the bit where we're waiting for things to be made good, a bit where brokenness is normal. And and just think about what a difference that would make to someone that's struggling. Let's use anxiety as an example. You walk into church feeling the weight of anxiety, scared to talk to the people around you, worried about where to sit. But you walk into a room where everyone else looks sorted, everyone else is smiling, everyone else is acting confidently, everyone else is talking about what's gone well. Instantly you feel confidence. Instantly you feel a failure. Instantly you feel like some kind of bad Christian. Not that that category really exists. But imagine that same person with anxiety walking into a church and being met with people that are talking about what's been hard in their life. Not in overwhelming graphic detail, uh, but just a, a sense of life is tough. Imagine if they heard a sermon that talked about the welcome Jesus has for those who are struggling with anxiety. Imagine if they saw a bookstore that had books on anxiety and depression and and coping with the brokenness of life. What if they heard in the prayers people praying for those in the congregation who were struggling with anxiety? What if there was a testimony one Sunday morning? Not one of those testimonies of, I used to struggle and now I don't, but one of those testimonies that goes, I still find life hard, but God is good and this is how he's leading me forward. Imagine walking in that kind of church. The experience will be so different. In that kind of church, you're not othered. You're not separate. You're not worse. You're just one of the group of people who have broken bodies, broken hearts, broken relationships, in a broken world, who are following Jesus together. You can be a church where you normalise those kinds of conversations. You can't force them. Churches grow slowly. Churches grow really slowly. Uh, And I'm not suggesting that, you know, by this time next month, all of your churches will be having open and honest conversations about the brokenness of life. I'm not that naive. It takes a while for these things to grow. But if that is our aim, if that is something that each of us can help set a tone for, then gradually the culture of the church will change. If we can be people that naturally just pray with one another after the service, who spot when people are struggling and move towards them and offer help, offer listening, offer prayer. They may not want it, that's okay. But to spot and to love and to speak and love. If we're people that on Wednesdays when we bump into somebody in whatever your supermarket of choice happens to be, just happens to say as part of a conversation that might range from the football to the latest sitcom to what's happening to the children in the after school club, at some point just pose the question, how is that sermon we heard on Sunday impacting what you're going through right now? Is there any way that's brought hope or comfort or, or, or something to help you persevere? People that just join the dots really normally and naturally. Then actually the miracle of the car park goes away. And we become an authentic, real, gritty, raw, messy group of people who love Jesus. That's not going to worry him. He came for the sick, not the well. He came to spend his time eating and drinking with the sinners. But it will challenge us and our desire to be seen as sorted, shiny, together. 
Well, one of the things I'd love us to be doing today is a bit of peer learning from one another. Uh, and just sharing the good practice that's already going on in our churches. And so what I'm going to do now is going to ask you to go into groups, and we'll do this for, let's do it for six minutes. You know what it's like, you know, you, you break out room start at six minutes, there'll be two by the time we get to the end of this session. Uh, but we'll start with six minutes to, to give us all a good time. And I just love you to share what your church does well in this arena of raising, raising awareness and setting a culture of care. Now, the main things in your church that it doesn't go so well. We can pray about that later. Uh, this is about focusing on what is going on. <coughs> and let's just see if we can get a bit of um, peer learning going, uh, and some of which we can share uh, afterwards. So, six minutes in our breakout rooms or with the person next to you. How is your church doing this? Raising awareness and culture setting really well. See you. Great. Well, I hope you have a good chat. Those guys, uh, minutes fly by, don't they? Uh, but just a few thoughts. I don't want to sh shout out anything that your church does really well. Um, no, we're going to need a uh, very long story, little stories for the uh, but something that you'd like to share as a good practice. I think creating a safe spaces. Yeah, safe spaces. And, and that can be whole church or it can be smaller parts, but the, for people to know there's safe spaces where they can be utterly honest, utterly open, and know that there's a people who are genuinely here. Safe so spaces nice, space. can be honest, people that are genuinely here, and that is so important. I mean, it's very tempting in a session like this to go, well, what can we say? What can we do? What practical strategies can we put in place? And hopefully we will get onto that. But actually none of that will land if people don't feel safe enough to open up. And so this creation of a culture of care is the foundational bit that, that has to be there before anything else will really work with any degree of effectiveness. Thank you. Yeah. Um, intergenerational relationships. Thank you. Intergenerational relationships. And that's so important. I remember, I mean, I work for Biblical Counseling UK. I, I have a, a fair degree of understanding from a sort of an academic point of view. But I've also been in the pit of depression. I've also struggled with anxiety. And actually, this is with Jesus now, but Daphne was my absolute go-to person. And everyone needs a Daphne. She was in her 80s. She was housebound. She was riddled with arthritis. She had a ridiculously overweight cat. Um, and all day, every day, the television was on at full blast. No, she was not the poster girl of how to do biblical ministry. <laughs> and yet, over a cup of tea and an abundance of cake, she would listen and pray. Just one example, and there are many other examples of intergenerational uh, relationships that they really matter. Anything else? We've got several coming from online. Um, Hospitality, welcome pe welcoming people who come to the church. Um, even if it's not a safe space, we can have a brave space. I like that. Um, acceptance, relationship building. People who need to can feel that they can speak to you and, then, and that you will listen and in confidence. Yes, thank you. So there, there's lots there. Hospitality. I like that idea of a brave space. Like I'll have to think about that more. That the term resonates instantly, doesn't it? Uh, where we can step out of your comfort zone and know it's okay to do that. Uh, and that listening in. Confidentiality is something that we're going to circle back to later. It's a really important point. Um, but yes, thank you. All wise words. Now, I, I've given the majority of our time to something that probably sounds fairly achievable. Uh, partly that's intentional. Because I want you to go away feeling that there is something entirely achievable uh, that you can do when you get back to your churches. But also to remember that this is foundational. And we want to get this culture piece right. But let's look at some of the other facets that we might want to uh, skill up in as we go along. Now, now for many of us, uh, if not most of us, if not all of us, reading God's word is part and parcel uh, of what it is to do the Christian life well. And many of us will, will read it on our own, day by day. Uh, many of us will read it in small groups uh, midweek. Uh, many of us will, will engage with the Bible on Sunday mornings. That is essential. 
Yeah. God's word is, is more than a book. It's living and active. It, it changes us as we engage with it. But actually, if someone is really struggling with their mental health, then listening to a... Now, see, if I pick a number, there's going to be someone shocked in this room. Do I go for a 20 minute, a 30 minute, or a 40 minute sermon, or should I just take a 10? <laughs> well, I scroll up. If we go for a sermon, it, it, it's going to feel too long for someone that's really struggling with their mental health. And, and you know, one of the challenges, if you've got someone that's concentrating for eight minutes or six minutes before it's impossible for them to take anything else in, often at that point in the sermon, you've just basically done the introduction pose the question about why everything in life is so bad and so hard and started retelling the Bible story and you haven't even got close to what the Bible passage means or how it's going to help. Uh, and so in our traditional preaching, often the people that desperately, well we all desperately need, but you know, the people that desperately need to hear that sense of hope will, will stop listening way before that hope is shared. It's the same with our, our midweek Bible studies. Actually, we, we often uh, we have a natter over coffee, great thing to do. Then we'll go through the passage, we'll answer our little questions on what the passage means. And then probably you know, 45 minutes, an hour later, depending on the tradition of your church, you might get to how does it apply, although you might have run out of time at that point and you never get to how does it apply. Uh, and then you, you dive off into prayer. Uh, and, and then the prayer is not necessarily related to what the passage was anyway. The prayer goes off in lots of different directions. And so, again, the way we read the Bible sometimes leaves us without the hope that we need, without the joining of the dots between life and God's word and, and prayer. Now, please don't mishear me. I'm not knocking long sermons, nor am I knocking midweek Bible study groups. I think they are both brilliant and beautiful. But we need to remember that actually sometimes people are going through things, which means it's really hard for them to engage with that. Uh, imagine, for instance, I've just had some major surgery. Uh, I've come out of surgery, the anaesthetic's wearing off, uh, but I had some sort of gastrointestinal uh, work done. No one's going to give me a steak dinner that day. I don't know what the hospital fare will be, but I guarantee you it is not going to be large chunks of meat, huge quantities of pie, or anything like that. It's going to be soft, easy to digest kind of material. And sometimes when people are going through profound mental health struggles, we need to give them a spiritual... It's going to sound desperately irreverent. I do apologise if it does. Uh, the spiritual equivalent of Jenny. Not in the sense we want it to wobble, we don't, we want to and the true, uh, but we want it to be easily digestible, easy to take in, quick and easy nourishment that will make a difference. And that means that if we're meeting together with somebody one-to-one -one or meeting with a group of people that are struggling, then actually maybe we want to look at really short passages. There's no prizes in the Christian world for extra long Bible studies or extra long passages at any given moment in time. Take something that's bite-sized, something that people can concentrate through, something that's memorable. Go maybe a little more towards narrative and poetry than proposition and argument. Now that doesn't mean you ignore the proposition and the argument, but maybe weight it a little bit more towards narrative and poetry. Well, why do I say that? Well, Again, let's go back to that person in the church that's feeling deeply anxious. You, you look at the passage in Philippians that says, do not be anxious about anything. Uh, and what have you got there? You've got a statement that says, do not be anxious. Now, if you've got a good Bible study leader, we'll then go on and talk about the importance of prayer and what difference that relationship with God makes. But if we look at the proposition, do not be anxious, Often we end up with a sort of dynamic where the anxious person sitting there going, I'm anxious. And then the Bible says, well, do not be anxious. And therefore the person says, but I am anxious. But the Bible says, don't be. And so we end up with this kind of spiritual stop it, which doesn't really help anybody. But if we go to narrative and look at Ruth as she moved from Moab, 
back to Israel, not knowing what the future would hold. Burdened by grief, saddled with the world's grumpiest mother-in-law. Then we see a little bit about what living with uncertainty or fear could look like. Uh, as we look at how Joseph uh, was when he was forgotten by his friends in prison, we see a worked example of actually trusting God when abandoned, when in the face of injustice, when humanly speaking it was hard to see any hope. We don't have a stop it. We don't have a sticking plaster. We have an example to follow. Now, I, I do want to reiterate that we don't, we don't want to knock Pauline literature and the epistles. There is beauty and truth there. And actually, if you handle places like Philippians well, it doesn't have to sound like stop it. It can sound like a beautiful call to prayer. But when someone's really struggling, give them the thing that's easier to digest. Give them the thing that they can wrestle with a little bit more without the tensions going on. And explore with them. Now, it's very easy if you're a preacher or if you're a Bible study leader to go, and, and this is what the passage says. And, you know, and there is a place for that. I, uh, I am passionate that, you know, the Bible is clear. It's not an up for grabs, anything could happen in this passage kind of sense. You know, the Bible speaks, and God is not a God of, you know, trying to make things opaque. But actually, allowing people the opportunity to explore within that sort of context of trying to explore to find what God is saying then that can be a lot healthier because if you set up that dynamic of I am teaching you and you must accept it, then there is a sense in which people get scared. But what if I don't believe it? What if I don't understand it? And the anxiety levels just go up. But if you quietly explore passages together, what do you think? Well, let's just test that out. Does that that connect with that bit over there? Is that all building with a picture that that is consistent with who God is and what he's saying? Does that fit with the context? If you go on that journey together, people aren't so scared of getting it wrong. They're willing to go out there and seek what God is saying. If someone is very much in the depths of anxiety or depression, I restrict myself to three questions if I'm working with them. Um, I don't call it a Bible study, because studying sounds way too scary. Uh, I, I go around to their house or they come around to mine. We sit on our respective armchairs. If it's winter, it, there's a blanket and a mug of something hot. And I just say, let's just listen to our Heavenly Father for a moment, shall we? Let's just talk to Dad. And we read just a couple of verses. And I simply say, what does that help us understand about God? What does that help us understand about how to live in his world? How does that nudge us to pray? Same three questions each time until they're feeling stronger. And then we can get a bit meatier again. But until then, it helps them turn to the Lord, helps them connect with God, what God is saying in their lives, and helps them speak to Him in ways that are full. Engage the heart. I mean, I'm all for talks on predestination. And it's fascinating, and it's important, it's an exciting doctrine. But there are moments for talks on predestination, (laughs) and moments not for talks on predestination. And if someone is really struggling with anxiety, that's probably not where you want to go. Go for a psalm that will bring comfort, go for a psalm that will bring hope, go for a metaphor that shows that God is king, that he is a rock and a refuge, that he is somewhere they can run, or that somewhere he is already surrounding them, already making them saved. And use testimony as well. Show how the Bible has changed you. Maybe even think about that for a second now. If someone asks you the question, how has engaging with God's word changed you in recent weeks or months? What would you say? Again, I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud. But do you have a testimony? Can you see that it's helping you grow in contentment? Can you see that it's helping you grow in patience? Can you see that it's helping you grow in trust? 
And whatever that is, share it. Show that it works because it does, because God is good. God works. And as you're doing that, you're relating to people well. Now, there are some people in this world that it is easier for us to get on with than others. Let's just be honest. That may not be the most politically correct thing to say, but there are some people we meet instantly. We like them. We start chatting very easily. And there are other people where we get 30 seconds into the conversation and we stall and we're not quite sure where to go next. That is life. God has made us very different. But actually, all of us are more similar to one another than we are different. We are all, as Steve was saying, those people with hearts and and bodies, we're embodied souls. We're all living in in the same world. We're all living under God's rule. We're all in need of his grace. We're all in need of his mercy. We're all in need of his love. We're, We're united, one body, one church, one father, one spirit, one Lord and Savior of all. And that person that is really struggling is more like us than they want as well. Even that person, uh, a lovely, lovely chap uh, that I uh, uh, still have some contact with, who it is very difficult to see him grappling with reality sometimes. He is absolutely convinced that many, many people have tried to murder him. He is absolutely convinced about many conspiracy theories. He is absolutely convinced that he's just about to win this really big court case that's going to bring in the biggest settlement that anyone has ever seen. He is absolutely convinced that he is getting special messages from God. He is absolutely convinced that the church has got everything wrong. Am I more like him than I am different? Yes. I may not believe all the same things he believes. I may not want all the same things that he wants. But over my heart, we are both <coughs> human. We are both image bearers of the Lord. We are both children of God. He does believe. We are both people who need Jesus equally. And therefore, relating in that really humble way and being willing to move towards one another is so important. Now, there needs to be wisdom. You know, there are some situations, though, that chap that I've just mentioned, I wouldn't go around to his house on my own. There have got to be wisdom and boundaries here. You know, meeting in a public place, there's probably going to be two of us. You know, safeguarding protocols are important. I'm not suggesting irresponsibility here. But a humble heart that desires to move towards others rather than not. I learned a solitary lesson a few years ago with uh, one lovely lady with very severe mental illness um, who used to phone me 22 times a day. At least at her worst, she used to phone me 22 times a day. I didn't pick up the phone 22 times a day, I hate to that. Uh, but she would phone me at that time. And there was this dynamic after a while. And I really struggled with that because that's a lot of time for your phone to go off. And people used to say to me, just switch your phone off, Helen, but then the rest of the world can't get hold of me. Uh, And actually, there are other people out there who I do want to talk to on the phone. And and, and this dynamic set up is she would phone and I would not answer, and then she would phone and I would not answer, and then she would phone and I would not answer. And it's almost like we were chasing each other down the road, me running away, her desperate to have a conversation. Until someone wise said to me, why don't you invite her around for dinner with a couple of other friends? Really? Oh, it's just, this just feels too hard. But she was desperate for connection. Desperate to be treated like a normal human being. Desperate for a, a normal social interaction. And all right, those desires were going astray in the way that she was uh, displaying them. But that was what she wanted at heart. And I want a group of us, and again, it was thinking in a group, not just one-on-one, in a context in which she could have normal, natural, social interactions with people who love Jesus, people that would pray for her, people that would eat with her, people that would listen to her. Unsurprisingly, the number of phone calls just fell away. 
Now, I'm not going to pretend there were never any other records. And I'm not going to pretend there were never any other days when that number of phone calls didn't go up. But actually, the dynamic is broken. Rather than chasing each other, we were loving each other in ways that are manageable and community minded. And in the process, we want to be listening to people. We want to be people who are willing to go, tell me more, what does that feel like? Because one person's experience of anxiety is not going to be the same as another person's. One person's experience of depression is not going to be the same as another person's. You cannot hear the word psychosis or, or the words OCD or, or the letters PTSD and know what that person is going through. It gives you a clue, but it doesn't tell you much. So tell me, please tell me more, what's been hardest this week? What does that look like for you? What does it feel like? How does that impact your relationships? Tell us more. And to be people that are willing just to listen. Listen wisely through a lens, listening out for repeated words, listening out for how they're describing themselves, listening out for how they're describing God, listening out for how they're describing other people. But people that are listening quietly without feeling that pressure to interject and make it all right. But to get to know and understand them well. And to do that all with boundaries that are articulated and kind. I, I'm going back with some boys on the word boundaries. Someone boys uh, recently said to me, they don't like the word boundaries because boundaries divide. That's, that's, that's what boundaries are designed to do. You know, the boundary war between two houses, the boundary between two countries, they, they, they separate. Maybe as Christians, we should use the words limits more. But it's not that I'm trying to be separate from you or push you away. It's about, I can't do anything, and I just need to be honest that I can't do anything. And that means there will be times when we don't answer the phone. There will be times when we don't meet up with people. There will be times when we do take rest. There will be times when we meet in pairs. There will be times when we meet in public places rather than in a home. There will be times when we are really clear that we can't say call me any time because then the person might call us any time. And at three o'clock in the morning, I am not pastoral and I am not wise. <laughs> and I'm sure many of others of us here would be the same. So I, I try and do it as personal practice. Uh, of when someone comes to me for help, saying, yes, I'd love to walk alongside you in some way. Uh, just, just so you know, unless you're in a or, or in police custody, could, could you avoid phoning me before 8 in the morning or after 10 at night? Because actually I, I tend to be way more useful if I have 8, eight hours of switch off time for you. Just so you're aware, uh, but on Saturdays, um, sometimes I'm working in Cambridge, uh, places like the Faraday Institute, and my phone will be on silence, so I'm not going to be able to pick up. Oh, and, and when I go on holiday, then I tend not to engage with anything uh, back home at church. Just so people are aware, right from the offset, so it's not a shock uh, when things happen. Well, let's have another think uh, about what that might look like. You, you can chat in your groups again. We'll go back into our groups uh, just in five minutes at uh, this time. If you can um, reflect on anything that I've been speaking about in those last couple of slides, but maybe most particularly those boundaries and those limits. What are some of the things that make it really hard to do that well? Let's do five minutes and then we'll come back together again and then zoom through the last lot of slides. Any sort of very quick comments uh, or questions on that at all? Uh, we'll need to move on in just a moment. But any uh, quick things anyone wants to feedback on mm. us? Yes, please. Do we find it hard to set limits because we like the sense of being dependent on and helping, and therefore, actually, there's a problem in our understanding of God being a sufficient provider? Thank you. Uh, some of us do indeed uh, struggle with saying no because we like to be the saviour rather than uh, pointing to Jesus as our saviour. Uh, now, I'm going to get the risk again of you thinking I'm completely daft. My solution to this is a hippopotamus. Um, let me explain. It may not be instantly obvious where I'm going with this. 
Um, do you remember the bit of uh, Joan um, after he, you know, he had everything, he lost everything, he, he got restored, and, and he said to the Lord, "What on earth is that all about?" And and God doesn't give him an answer. He just says, "Do you know when the sea monster is going to jump? Do you know when the eagle is going to take flight? Do you know when the lion is going to give birth?" Uh, in my deeply, uh, highly theologically trained way, I call that the "Can you make a hippo passage?" And basically, the thesis is: if you can make a hippo, you are God. If you can't make a hippo, you are not God. And uh, working on the assumptions, we are a non-hippo making community here today. We are not God. We cannot make people better. We cannot save. And so, our task is consistently to be pointing people to God. However, I forget that all the time. I am, you know, as, as Tim just described, someone that I like to have my superwoman cape on. I can do anything. I'm a professional. I'm the expert. Come to me. It's disastrous when I'm in that place. In fact, one of my pastors used to sidle up to me when he noticed that occasionally and say, Helen, just take your cape off. That's not what the church needs right now. And now, so wherever I do pastoral prayer, whether that is my living room, uh, my counselling room at church, uh, whether that is uh, my bedroom or my study, in every single one of those rooms, I have a hippo. I mean, a small hippo, not one size. <laughs> um, and that means whenever I'm doing pastoral work, at some point in the conversation, at some point in the email writing, my eyes will alight on a hippo, and I will speak to myself, ha, huh, they need Jesus for them. Let me just read those out. Now, you may not need a hippo in my life, that is not the biblical mandate, but I think having something that reminds us of our finitude, something that reminds us of our creatureliness, and something that reminds us that people need Jesus far more than us is important. So find the equivalent of a hippo for you that will remind you of that fact. It's very important to you. Uh, let us uh, move on uh, very quickly because we're almost out of time and there's a ridiculous number of slides to go through. So let us uh, dive in. Remembering our identities. If you've got a Bible, can you just grab it for me? <coughs> uh, and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Um, if you haven't got one to use it, don't, don't worry, uh, I'm going to read out a little bit. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, and verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, when people are struggling with their mental health, it's almost like they can be looking into, remember those concave and convex mirrors that used to find at fairgrounds? Uh, you know, you used to look in there and you get a completely distorted image of yourself. Having lots of mental health struggles is a bit like that. We see God in a really distorted way. We can see him as distant and unkind and uncaring. And we can see ourselves as unlovable, awful, worthless, useless, pointless, waste of space. And that feels so true when in the depths of mental health struggles. But actually, the Bible doesn't leave us with that identity. 
Uh, let's look at it. Just cast your eyes back down Ephesians 1 again. Shout out what is true of every single one of us on this course, no matter what our struggles are, no matter what our background is. If we are in Christ, what is true of us? Just pick out random words from Ephesians 1 and shout them out, and I'll repeat them just in case they need to be amplified. Anyone got one? Let's do it. We're blessed. Blameless. Blameless. Chosen. Loved. Loved. Adopted. Adopted. Thank you. Redeemed. Redeemed. Brought back in Christ. Forgiven. Forgiven. Indwelt by the Spirit. Heading for heaven. <coughs> Lavished with grace. Lavished with grace. What a wonderful world. Lavishes. Mm. And can you see how, I mean, that's not going to take away someone's anxiety or depression in one without story. But can you see if you can gradually just go to someone like Ephesians 1 and go, I know you feel like a miserable worm, but this is what the Lord says of you. You are chosen. You are clothed. You are lavished with grace. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are adored. You are precious in his sight. You are indwelt by the Spirit. You have a deposit guaranteeing that the future is good. There is no such thing as an unhappy ending for those who are in Christ. That is who you are. Now, if you can do that gently and over a period of time with people, and help them see that they are not pointless, but gifted. That they are not uh, unloved, but adored. That they are not dirty, but lavished with grace. That makes a difference to how they feel. It doesn't simply make everything right, but it makes a difference. And so actually working on identity can be a really key place to turn with anyone that's struggling. Well, indeed, with anyone, don't we all struggle with that from time to time? As Steve was saying, we're all on a spectrum, so it's no worry, wonder that we all struggle in some ways. Helping people think about that sense of, of wonder of who God has made them to be. And, and we don't want to go to the world's rose-tinted mirror. It's not your perfect just as you are. It's not going you know, to be proud of who you are and never change. It's not kind of like all the L'Oreal moments where we toss our hair and say, well, because I'm perfect. No, this is who God has made us to be, because he chose us and he adores us. And it's far deeper and more precious than any self-help boosting of ego. And similarly, we want to be, help people be sure of who God is. He is not distant, he is present. He, he is not un unloving, he is kind. He is not angry, he is merciful. And we can pick up on those metaphors of him being a shepherd, a king, a rock, a refuge, a shield, a wing over our heads. I don't think I ever understood Psalm 91 until about a month ago when I went flying birds to pray for a belated birthday treat. And it all went slightly wrong when a very large owl landed on my arm. His wing just ended up over my head for a good few minutes. And I thought, I don't quite know what I'm supposed to do with a very large owl wing uh, underneath it over the top of me. But as I was there, being slightly awkward, there was that sense of, oh, actually, this is really warm. <laughs> actually, that wing above me is really strong. Actually, it smells really good in here. <laughs> Things I wasn't expecting. Engaging with who God is. Helping people see clearly again. Again, that's not going to take all the mental health struggles away. But it does a little. And we do that by engaging in a, in a process of change. Now, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, is basically our model of change, one of the models of change in the Bible. Take off your old self, renew your mind, put on your new self. We must never, ever, ever, ever use that simplistically. It is not take off anxiety, think happy thoughts, bounce off into the future like a bunny. That would be cruel in the extreme. But actually, if we can help people just take one of their beliefs, I'm unlovable. I go, actually, hang on a second, every time I think I'm unloved, <coughs> that's an old self thought. Let me just remind myself the Bible says I'm adored. 
okay, Lord, maybe it doesn't feel credible right now, but help me to know that I'm alive. That's done well and done. That's just something to do every day for weeks, months, maybe even years. And little by little, people can move from the place of going, I'm unloved, to a place of, I feel unloved. To a place of, I feel unloved, but that's not what the Bible says. To a place of, well, I suppose I have to acknowledge God does say he loves me. To a place of, I'm finding it hard to believe, Lord, but thank you, Lord, for God's love. To a place of, can I be really loved? To a place of confidence. I am a daughter. God absolutely loves me. And if we can help people go on that journey of change, little by little, patiently, kindly, fueling with God's word, it can take them to a place of, well, there is a world of difference, isn't there, between battling some struggles, feeling unloved, and battling some struggles, knowing that you're safe in the Father's eyes. But knowing that in those Deuteronomy words that the everlasting arms of the Lord are under your hands. That's a very different place to that one. For some people, that will actually have a real impact on their anxiety or, or on their depression. For others, it won't actually impact their feelings, but it will impact their ability to persevere through those feelings. Either of those outcomes is good. And we can do that with all, a whole host of things. You know, that sense of, I'm all alone, nobody cares. No, 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 Psalm 139 says you cannot go from the east or the west or the heights or the depths to get away from God. It is impossible as a Christian to go through anything alone. Or oh, that sense of, I, I can't carry on, this is too hard. It's what the Israelites felt when they were wandering in the desert. They wanted to go back to Egypt two and a half months after the plagues and the Passover. I mean, you would have thought, you know, nine plagues, massive Passover, escape from Egypt, seeing the parting of the sea, going on into the desert, being led by the Lord in tangible ways. It doesn't get much more miraculous than that. And yet, two and a half months later, they were going, let's just go back to slavery. And when Moses pushes them for a reason, you know what some of the answers they come up with? Cucumbers. We had cucumbers back in Egypt. <laughs> now, I'm a big fan of the cucumber. But I am not going to sell myself back into slavery to eat one. But that is what we do in our struggles. We get so scared of going forward that we run back, no matter how bad our past was, knowing that we can carry on because God is providing man and quail every day, giving us what we need for the next moment, giving us what we need to persevere. It's an important thing to know. Knowing that we don't have to carry on through life feeling guilty, being guilty, because of Jesus' work on the cross. There is freedom. What whiter than snow, as David said in his psalm. When we think it's all out of control, we, we can help people see that actually it's mysterious and it's painful and it can't easily be explained, but it's not out of control. Do you remember Joseph? Hated by his family, almost murdered, thrown into a well sold into slavery, put into work in a home of an immoral woman, accused of a crime he didn't commit, imprisoned unfairly, forgotten by his friends, only able to get out of prison to do a, a humanly speaking impossible task. And when with the Lord's help he was able to do that, he was then given the job of <clears throat> leading an entire region through a multi-year famine relief program. I mean, the Bible never says that Joseph was anxious, but I, I'm pretty sure he had that. But actually, for him to be able to get through that and go, no, no, what you intended for evil, my brothers, and it was evil. He didn't didn't brush it under the carpet, even it was. God intended it for good. God has a plan on even the most awful of circumstances. Nothing is out of control. There is no hope. No. There is no such thing as an unhappy ending for those who are in the past. Now, we don't want to say any of those things unkindly, quickly, or thoughtlessly. But the more we can just weave those things in normally and naturally into conversation, throwing, um, showing from the Bible how those things are true, the more there is a little drip, drip effect into people's lives. Use it in testimony. 
convey those things in song, not necessarily you actually singing, for some of us that would be disturbing in the extreme, but actually finding a song that puts some of those truths to music and send a song in on Spotify rather than actually saying out loud. Use whatever creative means that are necessary. Art, if, if art is useful in that circumstance, we're in a room surrounded by some lovely art today. And alongside all that, rotating the practical help. I'm not going to spend time on this because most churches do this very easily indeed. Get the meals around there, offer them this, help with paperwork, get a Labrador, take it for a walk, make sure people get to their appointments. They are all things to do helping. Uh, along the way. And just as uh, Steve uh, stole an extra two minutes of your time, I'm going to do that too. Uh, working on the assumption there's grace for that. We do that with corporate confidentiality and intent to invest. We are all finite and we can't do this 24 7. We all need a break and we all need each other. Now, if we've got questions on confidentiality, they can come into our final session. We're very happy to chat about that. But the basic thing I'd love us to be wrestling with is when people share stuff with us, they are sharing what some people call the fine china of their life. It is precious. It is fragile. We want to handle that wisely and well. We don't gossip it. We're not careless with it. We've got to be really, really kind. But actually, none of us have the gifts or the capacity in and of ourselves to help anybody. We will always need to be working in teams. And therefore, working out how you share information within those teams is really important. You know, in the wider world, there's no more such thing as absolute confidentiality. Any medical profession is going to have a team around them. Uh, any uh, social worker will have a team around them. Uh, there are always others that can see that information, always others where that information can be passed on to. As a church, we don't want to try and adopt a model that isn't used anywhere else because it doesn't work and it's not safe. But we do need to have a model where we can share with named people who will accept that information wisely and carefully and use that information to support each other well. Then it will all flow and we will care well for each other. Well, we're going to have to leave the questions uh, for another time uh, later on today. There's plenty of question time ahead, but just uh, a few things to find out. If any of the things that we are saying today spark an interest in you, well, obviously there's the book on over there, uh, and I can see already some of the piles are going down, so thank you for that. There is our certificate course, uh, which is run uh, in a, a range of areas. Uh, the nearest to here would be at London or our online cohorts um, at the moment. Uh, and you can look at a range of modules, starting with how can you change that dynamic that people change, how to help in relationships, how to do conversations well, uh, uh, and then how to do pastoral care in the local church. So our certificate course is running, uh, there are details uh, available on screen. Uh, and if you fancy dipping a toe into that and not signing up for the whole thing, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you can do uh, the first module spread over from January to July, uh, at basically at half speed. Uh, uh, which enables you to do it at a moderate uh, pace, and we are very happy to talk to you about that. Uh, the uh, deadline for the six month option is Monday, uh, just to uh, flag up. So if anyone is interested, maybe talk to Steve and I today, uh, and uh, we can uh, get back. If any of you are about to take a sabbatical, uh, we can arrange you for you to sell those courses uh, at a, a much more uh, convenient uh, pace for you. And there is our website, of course. Uh, so there will soon be a brand new website. Give it a few more weeks. It's going to be extraordinary. Uh, but what's there is already good. Uh, so audios and articles, books and book clubs, training, discussion starters, all that, two weeks, and a few other books, uh, some kinds of ones. We need a bit of refreshment, don't we? We need to cool down a little bit. We need a, a few calories inside us to burn on. But hopefully there have been some ideas there for you to take away. Please don't try and do everything. Please just pick one thing from this morning and go, Lord, please help me do that this week and help me do it. Please do that to you.